Releasing in Australian cinemas in early June on Q&A and then in cinema is a documentary called Endangered Generation? Question mark. And it's my great pleasure to be talking to the director of Endangered Generation, Celeste Gear. Celeste, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you very much for having me, Peter. Tell me, uh, this is such a fascinating look at uh, sort of uh, almost global cooperation uh, in terms of finding ways to combat climate change. How did it all come about? Actually, the genesis of the idea was it came from a university, from Monash University, who wanted to look at the idea of how academics are actually engaging in some of the critical real world challenges of our time around climate change, around um, social equity and around human health. And so it was a very broad project that was let's find some people collaborating in ways that they we might not be used to people collaborating and let's see what happens as a result of that collaboration. And so that's how the project began. And we were able to call on Monash academics, but we were also able to look much more broadly. And as is the case with documentary, you start speaking to one person during your research and then they say, but have you met Joe Michaels who photographs icebergs in Antarctica? And then Joe invites you to go and meet someone else. So it's a very organic, evolving process. How interesting. And, and of course, the other aspect of making this film is getting production behind you, and uh, uh, that must have been quite a task for you. Well, actually, this was one of the easiest films <laughs> I've ever made because in terms of that, because when I came on board, the producers uh, had already done an incredible job um, in getting all of that into play. So it was a very, very rare opportunity in a documentary filmmaker's life when they get taken on board a project and it's all ready greenlit. Ah, well, that's great to hear. And, and uh, okay, so tell me about your process because I noticed you co-wrote the script with Chloe Hooper. Tell me about that. Well, Chloe, of course, is an incredible talent. Um, she came on board quite late in the piece, actually, once we originally... The voiceover was recorded featuring me, the narrator, and then after we'd already locked off that cut, we got the exciting news that my understudy, Laura Dern, was available. So, <laughs> so, so we suddenly realised that we might need to um, really concentrate on the words that we were going to be asking Laura to say. I'm, I'm making light of it. Of course, we were taking the narration writing very seriously from the beginning, but once it was elevated to the level of having the incredible Laura Dern deliver those lines, we wanted to make sure we'd used all available resources to make those words as strong as possible. So we were able to collaborate with the wonderful Chloe Hooper. Ah, how excellent. And Laura sounds so good uh, as uh, as the narrator. It's a, a, it, it's a nice, subtle approach, which I really enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking for someone who had a real warmth yeah. And an earth, earthly quality, earthy quality to her voice, which I think Laura does. She does, yep. Okay, now tell me about the filming process because your film was shot in Panama and Indonesia and uh, a number of other countries. Uh, that in itself must have been a challenge to uh, to get to these places and find the right people, uh, as you've already alluded to early on, uh, to be part of the film. It was, and that task was made all the more complex by the fact that we were making it based in Melbourne and it was during all of the lockdowns so we had to find some very ingenious ways to direct talent and to find talent so I did a lot of the research via Zoom just in the front room of my house in lockdown in one of the final lockdowns of Melbourne and then once we'd established rapport with characters and worked out if they had an actually a live project that they were going to be working on that we would be able to follow filmically, we would then deploy local crews in the same place as that particular um, then direct some of that shooting via Zoom from my home. 
but of course all of the filming that involved Australian um, people and storylines we were able to film here and I of course had the incredible privilege of traveling to Panama so I was in the jungle and on the islands and rafting down a river so that was a absolute career highlight Ah, how how exciting, how adventurous. But and, and Panama doesn't often get much of a, a Guernsey in terms of these sorts of documentaries. So that was quite a coup, I thought. It, I mean, Panama is read about as being you know, a kind of like a tax haven. And I think it's known for being able to hide very wealthy people's money but in fact it's got this incredible biodiversity and the particular part of the jungle where we were in the Mamani Valley is one of the most biodiverse areas on earth and it was just an incredible privilege it's it's been it's actually an indigenous owned co-marker or territory and so the Guna people there have taken incredible care of of the land and it's an amazing Amazing state. Yes, to yes. be in Panama, and and also Panama. Worth looking at is it's actually one of the, the only three countries in the world that's already carbon neutral. So you know, in Australia, we talk about this thing of being carbon neutral as this idealistic vision that may never happen, but in fact. Where it, it is already a reality. And the delegation who we feature in the film, who go to COP26, were one of one of the youngest and most diverse delegations at all of COP. So they're actually quite exciting in terms of the leadership and the youth engagement in democracy. That that was so interesting, I thought, and uh, especially the sort of the sad note about uh, how COP26 didn't really address uh, climate change particularly well at all, which was very sad. Well, I think that it was a fascinating insight to look at how the decision-making happens at that level. One of the characters in the film, Juan Carlos Monterey Gomez, who were actually thrilled will be joining us by Zoom for one of the Q&A sessions. He's one of Barack Obama's kind of mentees or people that he's bringing up so he's a leader in the youth climate justice movement and he yeah he was made an amazing impact at cop but he talks about the process of decision making how there are these smaller nations who put to put a proposal out there and then the larger nations when it comes to deliberating the wording of those decisions just take the energy out of it and and kind of neutralize it. So yeah, I think that was that's pretty crushing for people who are fighting so hard on the front lines. Uh, absolutely. But I like the positive nature of of your film because it really looks at ways that countries are um, collaborating or finding ways to uh, to look at, uh, good examples of uh, combating the issue of climate change. Yes, and also not only countries, but individuals as well. So one of the things I was looking for when I was casting the film was people who were looking outside of their own particular silo, looking outside of their own particular field of expertise and being open to new ways of thinking. So we're looking for collaborations between artists and scientists, between Indigenous leaders and scientists, between um, activists and people involved in bureaucracy. So, yeah, I think it's when those different points of views converge that we have the most chance of having exciting breakthroughs. Great. That, that's uh, great to hear. Uh, I was interested in the animation that you used in the film. That uh, it was sort of so appropriate, I thought. <laughs> well, yeah, it's we're talking a lot about human beings' relationship to the natural world. And, of course, one of the strong points of the film is the very lush cinematography 
that happens that take we are transported from Antarctica to the jungles of Panama to the deserts of Borrego to the inner city informal settlements in Indonesia. So there's really diverse human and non-human landscapes that we're seeing. And we wanted to look at how human beings relate to that natural world. And of course, technology is such a ubiquitous presence in all of our lives. So it was great that we were able to use in a couple of those projects that are led by artists and economists and um, Indigenous songman Fred Leone using animation to bring those ancient ways of thinking and the intricacies of the natural world into a more contemporary environment. That works really well. I thought that was a great addition to the uh, to the film. And the other aspect of the film that comes through strongly is the notion of First Nations people or Indigenous people and their major contribution to our understanding of ways of combating climate change. Yes, I found that really inspiring was to learn more about some of the consistent threads that seem to exist with a lot of Indigenous understandings about our place in the natural world as human beings. It seems, and one of the ideas of the film is that humanity, we are finding ourselves in this very precarious position, perhaps because we have seen ourselves as being apart from nature. We've seen nature as a resource that we can use and draw upon for our own benefits. Whereas, in fact, if we interrogate that idea, we might think how else can we see our relationship to the natural world? Are we actually part of that world? Do we have responsibilities to the natural world? Um, and it's the reciprocal nature of that relationship that is so fundamental to so many Indigenous ways of knowing that I really wanted to explore in this film. Okay, excellent stuff. I was very impressed. And I also really enjoyed the music score by Thomas E. Rauch. Thank you. Yes, he's a beautiful composer and he works in a very emotional way, um, just, you know, we had a great collaboration where he took the emotion of a scene to use music as an invitation to the audience. And, yeah, I'm really thrilled with Thomas's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with all that footage that you had, uh, the, the the final part or the fun part of a documentary is always creating the final version and deciding what stays in the final cut and what has to be removed. Tell me about that uh, always daunting process. Yes, well, it was particularly daunting. <laughs> this was a particularly uh, tricky one because there were lots of threads and... I suppose one of the challenges throughout the film is getting the tone right because when you're making a film about the climate catastrophe, one of the characters in the film, George Monbiot, says, can we not call it climate change? I mean, climate change is just like a massive underselling of the problem. We could call it a climate catastrophe, a climate emergency, but not climate change, which makes the threat seem a lot more muted. But so I suppose... You want people to come to the cinema and to see a film and not to feel despondent and a total lack of agency at the end of it. So getting that tone right between showing that it's a serious problem but at the same time showing different ways that people are managing this problem in different disciplines and across science, arts, activism, it's actually quite hopeful Um I know the concept of hope sometimes gets a bad rap because it's seen as being like the uh, a fast track to inaction. But I think within hope, there's, you know, the possibility of being inspired. And that's definitely what drew me to all the characters in the film is that they are ordinary people who are committed to doing something um, more than just for themselves. They're looking outside of their own orbit and doing something for a greater good. And it's very inspiring to be in the company of those people. Oh, absolutely. Fully understand that. And and I, I think that there's a website that people can go to to get uh, more inspiration and, and uh, more information and so on. 
There is, there's theendangeredgeneration.com, which has all information about screenings and tickets. And I think we'll gradually get more information about the ancillary works um, of, so you can learn a little bit more about the scientists and artists who are featured in the film. Oh, excellent. Now, I know that the film is uh, doing some Q&A screenings from the 4th of June and then releasing on the 8th of June in cinemas. So it's rolling out in a in a particularly um, a clever sort of way, I thought. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it's actually designed around uh, World Environment Day, which is Monday the 5th of June. So the Q&A screenings are going to be around Australia on either... Monday the 4th or then the 5th rolling out to the other states. But we've actually got some really interesting speakers coming and participating in those Q&A sessions, leading thinkers across all the disciplines I've been mentioning throughout this interview. Um, and I feel like if you're at home on a Monday night or a Tuesday night, just in your own bubble or feeling despondent, being part of a communal screening of this film because it's basically about connection. It's about how we connect to the natural world and how we connect to each other. So it's a really beautiful film to see in a cinema and I think that the post-screening conversation will be invigorating. So I, I urge everyone to come. Absolutely. <laughs> and people are flocking back to the cinemas and I think that's a terrific uh, film to see as part of that so that's that's great news I must mention Celeste that um, I, I read that you won a Walkley award for your film Then the Wind Changed in 2012 you, uh, you've you really made some interesting choices in terms of the films that you're involved with Thank you um, well I'm very interested in both the natural world and also how human beings understand risk you know, we can know something in an academic way, but how does that impact our behaviour and what does it take for us to change? Like we all know factually that we need to do some pretty radical changes in the way our world is structured if we're going to survive. Like that's how serious it is. Mm. And yet we have this spectacular capacity, myself included, just, you know, to worry about have I got bread or you know, what's happening in my immediate world. So I find it just fascinating to think about what that says about us as a species. So I suppose my films look at that question from different angles. The first film was a very localised look at that because it was a personal account of my own family's experience living through the Black Saturday bushfires of 2009. I filmed it at a very kind of local way over three years. And then this next film is kind of revisiting that issue of how do human beings respond to risk and how do we live with the natural world and acknowledge the incredible forces of the natural world, um, but this time looking at a global scale and looking at it in a lot of different cultures and with a lot of different voices, diverse voices. So two very different approaches to a, a common theme, I think. How very, very interesting to hear that. And uh, I'm, am I presuming that you are already working on another film? Yes, I'm thinking of a black absurdist comedy <laughs> as an antidote to these questions, maybe a farce or, yeah, some slapstick. Yeah. W why not indeed? It's nice to uh, multiply your genres. So <laughs> I think so. You don't want to get typecast in this world. Yeah. Fair enough, too. Fair enough, Celeste. And the last question I love asking all my uh, interview subjects or filmmakers, have you seen anything else of late that has impressed you? Well, yes. I could answer in a highbrow or a lowbrow way. What would you prefer, Peter? Either is fine. Both, in fact. Okay. Well, I've just come back from New Zealand from the festival Dock Edge, which was a beautiful film festival, and the film here was the opening night film. And I saw another film by an amazing Romanian filmmaker about two African intersex people, and it was a very bold documentary vision that was really incredible cinematography and a very, very intimate piece. She'd 
lived with these people for five years. Right. So that was a very intimate and provocative film and I really enjoyed that. And yeah. then on the plane on the way home, I watched Colin from Accounts, <laughs> which is a half-hour comedy about some people who run over a dog, <laughs> and I found that hilarious. So, yeah, I think it's good to mix it up in life. Absolutely. Diversity is uh, always appreciated. So, <laughs> Look, Celeste, has been great talking to you. We've been speaking to Celeste Gear, who is the director of Endangered Generation in cinemas from next week. And uh, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Peter. Thank you. Okay. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.